What if I told you Jesus came to abolish religion? What if I told you voting Republican really wasn't his mission? What if I told you Republican doesn't automatically mean Christian and just because you call some people blind doesn't automatically give you vision? I mean, if religion is so great, why has it started so many wars? Why does it build huge churches but fails to feed the poor? Tell single moms God doesn't love them if they've ever had a divorce, but in the Old Testament, God actually calls religious people whores. Religion might preach grace, but another thing they practice, tend to ridicule God's people, they did it to John the Baptist. They can't fix their problems and so they just mask it, not realizing religion's like spraying perfume on a casket. See, the problem with religion is it never gets to the core. It's just behavior modification like a long list of chores. Like, let's dress up the outside, make it look nice and neat. But it's funny, that's what they used to do to mummies while the corpse rots underneath. Now I ain't judging, I'm just saying, quit putting on a fake look. Because there's a problem if people only know that you're a Christian by your Facebook. I mean, in every other aspect of life, you know that logic's unworthy. It's like saying you play for the Lakers just because you bought a jersey. See, this was me too, but no one seemed to be on to me. Acting like a church kid while addicted to pornography. See, on Sunday I'd go to church, but Saturday getting faded, acting if I was simply created to just have sex and get wasted. See, I spent my whole life building this facade of neatness, but now that I know Jesus, I boast in my weakness. Because if grace is water, then the church should be an ocean. It's not a museum for good people, it's a hospital for the broken. Which means I don't have to hide my failure, I don't have to hide my sin. Because it doesn't depend on me, it depends on Him. See, because when I was God's enemy, and certainly not a fan, He looked down and said, I want that man. Which is why Jesus hated religion, and for it He called them fools. Don't you see so much better than just following some rules? Now let me clarify. I love the church, I love the Bible, and yes, I believe in sin. But if Jesus came to your church, would they actually let him in? See, remember he was called a glutton and a drunkard by religious men. But the Son of God never supports self-righteousness, not now, not then. Now back to the point, one thing is vital to mention. How Jesus and religion are on opposite spectrums. See, one's the work of God, but one's a man-made invention. See, one is the cure, but the other's the infection. See, because religion says do, Jesus says done. Religion says slave, Jesus says son. Religion puts you in bondage while Jesus sets you free. Religion makes you blind, but Jesus makes you see. And that's why religion and Jesus are two different clans. Religion is man searching for God, Christianity is God searching for man. Which is why salvation is freely mine, and forgiveness is my own not based on my merits, but Jesus' obedience alone. Because he took the crown of thorns and the blood dripped down his face. He took what we all deserve. I guess that's why you call it grace. And while being murdered, he yelled, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because when he was dangling on that cross, he was thinking of you. And he absorbed all your sin and he buried it in the tomb, which is why I'm kneeling at the cross saying, come on, there's room. So for religion, no, I hate it. In fact, I literally resent it, because when Jesus said, it is finished, I believe he meant it. A Roman cross. Yeah, Jesus died on that. See, I don't care what you believe, just read history. It's a historical fact. So the question we have to ask is, what will you do with this man of misery? Six hours on a piece of wood, yet somehow it completely changed history. But see, we've pimped Jesus out. We've made a sacrifice foolery, like, oh, I'll just go to church on Easter and make the cross nice jewelry. But see, the cross wasn't a symbol of faith. It was a symbol of death. I mean, imagine if someone had an electric chair hanging around their neck. So the question we have to ask is what was different about the man that day that could take something that kills and turn it into something that saves. See, he was unique because he was innocent. God actually became a man. Now that's different. And on the cross, he says, I'm not dying because of me. I'm dying because of you. Not just for the sins you have done, but for the ones you will do. And on the cross, God treated Jesus like he was us, poured out his wrath on the Son so that he might show that he's just. See, and he took 
our filth and he took our sin and the beauties. When you trust in Jesus, you're included in him. But first, walk with me what it must have been like that night when the Son of God looked like he lost the fight. No heartbeat, no breathing, no sign of life. Jesus tasted death and it didn't feel right. Have you ever let that sink in that Jesus died? No, really, Jesus actually died. Three days in the tomb, lifeless laid his remains. Like the king had given up his crown, like he'd given up his reins. But all of a sudden comes Sunday, something started to change. From the grave you heard a thump, and blood started pumping in his veins. Heart beat and blood pulsing, instantly Satan felt his power break because the Son of God was dead. Now the Son of God is awake. And every breath that he took was another punch to Satan's face showing we are not under our sin, but we are under grace. So rejoice with me because when he went to the grave, you did too. And when he rose from the grave, your life became new. He says, my job is finished, let your new life begin. You can actually have freedom. Stop wallowing in your sin. See, the chains have been broken, the stone's been rolled away. God doesn't love a future you. He actually loves you today. So you're clean, you're spotless. The curse has been squashed. That's all baptism is, is just showing you've been washed. So rejoice with me because we are not awaiting the verdict. He's already said not guilty and the resurrection proves he assured it. Because our whole life we feasted on sin and we couldn't pay the tab. Jesus walks over to our bill and says, I'll take care of that. So stop trying to pay your own debt. In fact, God doesn't even expect it. Because the cross shows payment given, resurrection shows payment accepted. And instantly we were perfectly spotless when we were spiritual whores. Because when he walked out of the grave, he left our sin on the floor. And he turned around and looked at where his body lay and says, huh, sin? See, that's where you're gonna stay. So church, walk in freedom because you are free. The resurrection is just a stamp saying it's a guarantee, a royal decree proclaiming we're children of the king. So even when your mouth can't, let your life always sing. So I find that there's a ton of talk right now in the world with my friends, with my family, my neighborhood about sex and about what sex is. And I also find, at least as a follower of Jesus, that there's a chasmic gap between culture at large's definition of sexuality and God's definition. And by that I mean from the scriptures um, as Jesus would define it, as the biblical authors would define it. So basically, as I read it, culture at large defines sex as recreational play between two consenting adults. So it's just physical, it's just the biological coupling of two bodies for sexual release. And what's the big deal? As long as it's between two consenting adults, if it's mutually pleasurable, I mean, what in the world is the big deal? It's just play for grown-ups. And then the church often comes along and says, all okay, right, here's all the rules. Here's where you can do it and here's where you can't do it. But they buy into culture's definition of what sex is. And then basically say, well, you can do it, but only in marriage. And oh, by the way, only marriage between a man and a woman, not a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And to most of us, that's just nonsensical. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you hear that and you think, what, what kind of crazy, uneducated, traditional, outdated thing is that? It makes no sense. But reality, we have to get behind it to the definition of what sex is. So as I read the scriptures, as I read the teachings of Jesus, here's how I understand sex. In Genesis chapter two, the word echad is used, that in sexuality, two people become echad, or it can be translated one flesh. This is a graphic, weighty word that basically means, when it's put together with this word flesh, fused together at the deepest level. That in sex, a man and a woman come together and are fused together at the deepest level. It is the bonding of two people into one entity, body and soul, physical and spiritual, because there's no way to bifurcate the two. So it's actually a much higher view of sex than cultures. Culture basically says, hey, it's just play, it's just biological, what's the big deal? God says, whoa, 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 no, it's way more than that. It's two people who become one entity and then over and over again enjoy and express love for one another 
other through sexuality. Now, inside of marriage, this is beautiful because it, it takes two people and it doesn't let them drift apart. It keeps them together. It keeps them echad or one. But outside of marriage, this can be dehumanizing because it can turn people into objects for basically self-gratification. And then every time you walk away from a sexual partner, it's as if you tear echad, as if part of you is lost and you do that enough times and it starts to hollow you out from the inside. So I, as a follower of Jesus, think that we need a higher view of sex than culture at large is, not a lower view. We need to get back to the mysterious, beautiful, powerful reality of what happens when a man and a woman make love. It seems to me that the vast majority of us, at least myself, have a crystal clear idea of what marriage is. It's this idea of a man and a woman, or depending on where you're at, a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, in a relationship for life. But even through all the controversy and the volcanic backlash over the last few years to the ongoing redefinition of marriage, one of the really weird things to me is that through all the op-eds and controversy and the ongoing war on both sides, little or nothing was said about what marriage is for. I mean, what's the point of it all? And in a nation where one in three first marriages ends in divorce, one in two of all marriages end in divorce, which is an insane stat. If you think about the odds, if you're engaged right now to be married, the odds of your marriage making it past a few short years are 50-50. So why in the world would anybody take that risk? I mean, what's the, that's a legitimate question. So as we think about this idea of what marriage is for, as a follower of Jesus, my worldview is shaped by Jesus and the biblical authors. And when I read in Genesis 1 and 2, we read about kind of the proto-humans, Adam and Eve, and the first marriage of all time, and this is iconic line, for this reason a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. It's the first marriage of all time. And it's really interesting, if you read the story behind that statement, for this reason, you see a various, a laundry list of reasons for marriage. For example, you see friendship. We read that it's not good for the man to be alone, that we were created for relationships. Relationship. Secondly, you read what I would call gardening. There was this Garden of Eden, this world that was raw and untamed and wild and in need of ruling, of help, of a man and a woman to come together and to rule over it, to make something of it. And it's way too much work for one person. Adam needed help. He needed Eve. He needed a partner to do what God had put in his heart before. So obviously this is core. This is vital to what marriage is all about, a man and a woman coming together around something larger than themselves. If the point of your marriage is your marriage, it will self-destruct. If the point of your relationship is your relationship, it's only a matter of time until the wheels come off because marriage was made by God to exist for something so much larger than itself. So you have friendship, you have gardening, you have sexuality. Obviously, we were created as sexual beings as part of how God made us and marriage is the venue to express and enjoy our sexuality. You have family, you have that line, be fruitful and multiply. It's gonna take more than one man and woman to rule over the earth. It's gonna take all of the human race. And then we don't live in the Garden of Eden anymore. So in the wake of what we in theology call the fall, this idea of sin and its entrance into the human story, now I think a fifth reason is added for marriage, and that is this whole idea of becoming more like Jesus, becoming more like the image of God, the people that God made us to be, which is one of the best things about marriage. I mean, my wife sees the real me, not the real me that I am now, but the real me that I'm becoming, the man that God made me to me, and she pushes me and pulls me to that end. So she brings out the best in me, and living in close proximity to her, it exposes the worst to me, and this is such a great thing, because it means that I'm in trans it. My marriage is a main vehicle for me to get to where God's called me to be. So those are kind of five reasons that I see theologically for marriage. The problem is that's not why most of us get married. Most of us get married to be happy, but happiness is the byproduct of a healthy marriage. It's not the reason for. So if we go into marriage chasing after happiness, all that does is prime us at best for disillusionment and at worst for a 50-50 divorce rate. But if we go in chasing after friendship and gardening and sexuality and family and to become more like Jesus, then that sets us up for a little bit of the Garden of Eden.